Okay, good, good afternoon. So welcome. I'd again like to thank our sponsors, the Atkinson Center and the Department of Biological and Environmental Engineering for sponsoring this seminar series. So today is my great pleasure to introduce Jeremy Lee Wallace. And um, he's a professor in the Department of Government. He studies authoritarianism in China, city statistics and climate change. And his first book, which I think he'll say a little bit more about is Cities and Stability, Urbanization, Redistribution and Regime Survival in China. This examines the way China has managed its cities to maintain order. And the second book, which I think is almost out. Right? No, it's, 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 it's out, it's out. Okay, I thought I saw the cover. Okay, Seeking Truth and Hiding Facts, Information, Ideology and Authoritarian Rule in China and explores how and why authoritarian, authoritarian regimes rule as they do. Um, published numerous journal articles, published in the LA Times, the Washington Post, and he hosts a um, China Lab podcast, which is now on hiatus, I think. Yeah. Um, and Professor Wallace teaches courses related to urbanization, authoritarianism, and economic development. And he's gonna tell us about a new course he's teaching next fall. So let's um welcome to the small. So thank you everyone. You can hear me, I'm hoping. Great. Um so thanks for that introduction and thanks for all of you uh being here. I've uh studied uh, Chinese politics for my career. And one way you can think about me is that I am someone who writes books with maps of China on the cover. Uh, my first book, as, as was said, was about cities and stability, kind of the ways in which China managed urbanization. My most recent book, um, Seeking Truth and Hiding Facts, is about kind of the numbers and information and ideology inside of authoritarianism. And as you saw from this slide, the next book will probably be a book with a map of a green China on the cover um, about climate change, as I'm embarking on thinking about the politics and political economy of greening China. Um, my teaching, uh, just a, a little bit of introduction about me before we uh, shift to the, the subject of the lecture. Um, I teach kind of a, a number of courses and affiliated with the East Asia program on campus uh, as its director. Um, I teach on urbanization and authoritarianism, but of interest perhaps to this audience in particular in the fall, I'll be teaching a new class, Politics of Climate Change. It doesn't have a number yet, but assuming it gets approved, there should be a new, uh, new lecture class in the government department um, at 2000 level in the fall. And then next spring, I'll be teaching a course that I've taught many times, China's Next Economy, about economic development and economic um, activities in China, um, very contemporary in order. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I can't say a lot of things about like, this, this lecture series is really fun and there are a lot of really interesting talks about kind of like the drill, like the drilling that's happening off campus or kind of the, the PV like supply chain. But I, what I can talk about is politics and I think that the, the politics of the climate crisis um, are, are understudied or under um, appreciated in a lot of ways. Um, so this lecture is going to take part in like two parts. The first is about competing narratives of China and climate change that you probably have um, either heard of and you probably subscribe to one more than the other or maybe kind of a mix of both. And then a second piece about what I refer to as the carbon triangle. Um, so that's where I'm going to, to head us. Um, I will also say, if you are really interested in this work, um, in my kind of research, um, the topics that I'm talking about today, please do let me know. I'm interested in kind of always thinking about um, research assistance, especially if you have and either uh, Chinese language skills and or data visualization or programming chops. So that's those are people that I'm particularly interested in at the moment. Um, but both is is even better. But anyway. Um, so let me, let, me, let me start by talking about these competing narratives of China and climate change. So you perhaps, I don't think anyone is actually wearing this shirt, so I'm not calling anyone out, but this, uh, so you may be aware of this kind of, uh, this sentiment that science doesn't care what you believe. Um, and of course, there is something to be said for this, like it is happening, pandemics, climate change, what have you, these things are real. There is a physical, chemical, engineering and mathematical basis for them, and it doesn't matter, beliefs don't really matter. But that being said, we live in societies and societies, people's beliefs do matter. And politics does care what you believe and does care about what you prioritize and what you don't prioritize. Um, narratives in particular matter. The, the writer Rebecca Solnit put this very well. 
Every crisis is in part a storytelling crisis. This is as true of climate chaos as anything else. We are hemmed in by stories that prevent us from seeing or believing in or acting on the possibilities for change. Some are habits of mind, some are industry propaganda. We need to leave the age of fossil fuel behind swiftly and decisively, but what drives our machines won't change until we change what drives our ideas. And so in order to talk about the politics and economics facing China's decarbonization, which is the goal of the, the, the lecture, we need to talk a little bit of, and to confront and discuss the narratives that are out there in all of their contradiction. There are many grains of truth into these different perspectives and trying to wrap our heads around the relevant politics means thinking hard about them. And so what do I mean by these contrasting narratives? There is, I think, kind of two basic ones, especially in the United States, but I think broadly that China is first as the eco-villain, the destroyer of worlds. Um, and then the second is that China is some kind of eco-savior. Um, and that these competing narratives both, I think, have a lot of truth in them, a lot of interesting aspects that we should think about. Um, and so let's go through each of them in turn. So China as the eco-villain. So this kind of image is quite common. Um, the simple and most common narrative related to China and climate change is that China is the world's biggest emitter, a country whose growth has been fueled by the dirtiest of all fossil fuels, coal. And it obviously is. So I don't know to what extent you can see this, but this is kind of like who emits the most CO2. This is 2019 data, but the 2020, 2021, 2022 data are basically the same. China is around 30% of global emissions of um, of CO2 and more broadly of greenhouse gases. Um, and it is like by far the largest. In fact, it is larger than um, often kind of measured about as large as number two and number three combined. That is kind of the United States, Europe and India. So two, three, four combined. China produces as much greenhouse gas emissions as those three um, combined. Um, and so a couple of points to mention here. So often when we think about this, sometimes there is this recognition that, well, but China produces a lot of things for the rest of the world. And so should we think about kind of who is actually consuming that, those emissions, right? Because that's what we ultimately care about. If it is the case that kind of production emissions are different than consumption emissions, we should care about consumption-based emissions. But in general, in China, that's about 90% of emissions. That is, right, so if, if Chinese are making things for for me in the United States, who should get who should get blamed for those emissions? Is it the United States or me, or is it China where the production takes place? The emissions take place in China, but the consumption is in the United States. But actually, trade only accounts for about 10% of China's emissions. The vast majority of China's emissions are kind of taking place and consumed productively in China. Um, Second, so this chart, as are most of the charts here, are CO2 emissions, not all greenhouse gas emissions. And so do remember that in the end, that this is not the entirety of the story. Um, there's also methane and NOx and all the others um, out there. And China is a major piece of those as well. Um, third, and like many or most graphs, this ignores um, land use change, which is a significant piece, um, especially when we're thinking about deforestation, such as in Brazil or Indonesia, less of a big deal in China in the contemporary space. Um, but in the end, it is important to remember that China is um, China does pollute a lot. And how does it pollute or why does it pollute? Its CO2 emissions are overwhelmingly from coal, as, as kind of everyone understands. Um, oil, cement, um, these are kind of process emissions from cement, not just the, the coal emission, um, gas, um, and other kind of like things are there, but it is overwhelmingly a coal-based um, energy system. And so coal is the source of CO2 emissions in China. There is a flip side and a completely opposite narrative that has very different imagery. Rather than kind of old men pushing carts full of coal, you have images like this with kind of like uh, solar farms and wind turbines out um, to miles on end. And so this kind of diametrically opposed view is something you also hopefully are at least a little familiar with. China dominates the world in renewable energy generation and production. When we think about a clean future and maybe even when we talk more about the clean present, we need to think of China. Um, in particular, there's this quote um, from in 2020, um, this, uh, you may have heard of Adam Tooze, this, this writer who's everywhere now. And in 2020, he wrote this piece uh, following Xi Jinping's statement that China was going to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. 
um, how she just saved the world. So this kind of hyperbolic title. Um, but I do think that it's important to think about um, this idea and to take it a little bit seriously. Thanks to its gigantic surge in economic growth since 2000, its reliance on coal-fired electricity, which we just saw, China is now by far the largest emitter of carbon dioxide. And so, but by making the announcement that it is going to try to become carbon neutral by 2060, it actually pushed other countries around the world and other emitters, um, United States, European, and India, to kind of also make commitments to their own kind of carbon neutrality moments. Um, and it's not just solar, um, like kind of this dominance of China in kind of the renewable or clean tech space is, is there, both in terms of its own kind of like consumption or generation of these things, that is its own electricity um, renewables are kind of China is dominant, but it also is the core source of production for these things, in particular, most, most notably solar. Um, solar PV is overwhelmingly takes place in China or by Chinese firms in Southeast Asia. Um, it also dominates in the lithium ion battery space. And um, kind of, so it, it installs more wind and solar than anywhere else. It builds more wind and solar than anywhere else. It dominates the lithium, the battery space. Um, it is kind of the center in many ways of kind of this renewable, um, this renewable revolution that is taking place. And this is particularly important, I think, because solar is now cheap. Now, this is probably not like news to anyone in the room, um, but I do think it's important to think about and to recognize the extent to which this is a really changed um, political economy from where we were a decade ago. Um, decarbonization, moving away from fossil fuels, especially in energy, was going to be expensive, amazingly expensive. It was going to be expensive because renewables were more expensive than fossil fuels were cheap. That's no longer the case. The cheapest energy generation technology in almost any situation is solar PV with wind close behind. Um, the kind of ways in which this happened, and again, this is probably preaching to the choir, these kind of ideas, um, is that kind of the explosion in demand for solar PV that kind of like kind of came. Like initially, we had various ideas. Einstein, I guess, apparently, is, if you think about the origins of kind of photovoltaics in general, but kind of this really kind of came into scale with the um, feed-in tariff that the Germans put in, in the late 1990s, um, and uh, then saddle, and then kind of production in China and China's own feed-in tariff in the 2000s. And so as the Chinese industry grew, it became very competitive and prices continued to drop. Um, so again, this kind of narrative of kind of like learning curves and so forth, as production increases, the price of production, the price of the produced goods in decreases, um, is not just happening in, in solar PV, but it's happening in other domains as well, batteries and wind, what have you. And so again, I think it's really important to think about the extent to which this is, this is an important narrative. This is not a, we can decarbonize and not impoverish ourselves, but instead um, kind of live in, in relative plenty, uh, at least to some extent. Um, and so now we have to turn a little bit to kind of a darker side of this argument. So if China has been so successful in its kind of clean tech innovation, um, then we kind of think about this idea of eco-authoritarianism. Those of us who live in democracies have often become frustrated with the ideas and kind of slow pace of movement in democracies. And so this character whom I may, I, I don't know, time kind of moves very quickly for people, but this like Thanos in the kind of like the, the Marvel universe is this idea that there are too many beings and need to zap half of them away in order to kind of return to nature or to make things return to balance. This Malthusian kind of argument um, is one that few make today, um, but there are those who worry that democracy is insufficient to address the climate crisis. And it's not just kind of like there are people that make this case that there are kind of academics trying to argue that we need to think about this deeply when we think about what, what is legitimate government and what makes things um, acceptable. And so this was a, a piece that came out in a, a major academic journal um, in, for my discipline, political science, um, kind of said, is authoritarian power ever legitimate? Um, kind of contemporary literature thinks about legitimacy as democracy, but we really also need to care about ensuring safety and security. And in particular, maybe kind of in order to deal with the climate crisis, we need to think about authoritarianism as a, as a legitimate um, way to solve these, these problems, these crises. It is undeniable that the argument goes that nearly all wealthy democratic states have failed to respond adequately to the climate crisis. Um, but in doing so, kind of this 
this kind of argument kind of assumes away the problems of politics and authoritarianism, and assumes that eco-authoritarians really exist. Um, and in particular, this article kind of ignored and highlights that existing research points in favor of democracies doing more than authoritarian states on climate change. And that this exists even if you kind of really pay attention to what is what is happening and kind of, I think there is this, this hope and dream that kind of is, is separate from the reality. So the politics of this space, the politics of China need to be thought about as well. We can't just assume that an authoritarian is going to solve the climate crisis because we need it to. Um, there is another piece, which is, I think, even more prominent in 2023. Um, I, I, I don't want to talk about the balloon, but if people really need to talk about the balloon, I can talk about it. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I, I applaud you for paying attention to things that are more important. But the geopolitics of China and um, kind of its relationship to the United States in particular, I think, is an important one, especially when we think about the scale of kind of energy security, which has really come onto the map. Um, much, much more deeply in the past uh, two years. Um, societies don't run without electricity, right? How could we do this, um, this lecture, this kind of conversation on Zoom, what have you? Uh, people's finances grind to a halt when, with expensive gasoline. Um, people freeze without heat. And so it is natural that governments prioritize energy when thinking about their governance. And for the most part of the past two decades, though, the rich countries of the world basically have thought little about needing to kind of to kind of have energy security in their own borders, that they've trusted markets to deal with these problems, particularly with the, the world was awash in natural gas with the shale boom in the United States. And so with the recognition, particularly after the invasion of, of Ukraine, that kind of, that we need to think about energy and prioritize it more directly, um, countries around the world have focused increasingly on um, kind of this energy security issue, in particular with renewables. And so with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act last year, the European Union has kind of gone back and forth to the United States about can, can it keep up or is this fair? Um, China and the United States um, go back and forth as well. And so it's, it's about kind of who is going to, to win in this new clean energy race, what have you. And in part, it's because not just kind of hoping to be like good normatively for the world, but this is a massive economic sector. So the International Energy Agency kind of put out a report I'm suggesting that in order to get to net zero by 2050, that would involve around $100 trillion of investment. And so again, this $100 trillion is supposed to shock you and be like, that's a lot of money. But my notes specifically say that's a lot of money. Um, but this is, I do think, I do want you to kind of take this in two ways. One, it is a lot of money. And so governments or individuals are going to be thinking, how can I kind of grab my share of that money or make sure that it takes place in my borders rather than somewhere else? But it also... We have, we have 27 years until 2050 and a global economy that is $100 trillion every year. This is not the whole world needing to totally repurpose itself and to change how things are going. So this is kind of like this, this kind of geopolitical piece. Is China going to dominate this new energy revolution or is it going to take place in American borders? Is it going to take place somewhere else? These are real fights that are happening today. So that's kind of the first half, just kind of broadly, where is China in this space? What are different ideas about China, the complex realities of China and climate change? Now I'm going to kind of like switch gears and dive a little bit deeper into what I refer to as the carbon triangle. Um, and so part two, um, this term is mine. So if you Google carbon triangle, you're really not gonna get much, especially if you Google like China carbon triangle, it's mostly gonna be like, cardboard boxes that fit together. Anyway, it's just, it's just wherever those two words happen to, to come together. But the term, the term is mine. I, I have an essay that should be coming out next week or the week after I was hoping would time for this lecture. But um, when it is, I, I'll try to share it with everyone. So if you think about kind of different pieces of this story, China's kind of environmental and climate emissions have a lot of different pieces. The one I'm gonna focus on is this carbon triangle, land, cement, and steel. And really the real estate sector more broadly is of massive importance in understanding China's economy and politics broadly, as well as I would argue the future of global greenhouse gas emissions. So when we talk about China today and we think about kind of politics and everything that's going on, it's a, it's a turbulent time. It's a very like, again, I wasn't gonna talk about the balloon and I don't want to, but that we could also talk about that. But I think it's important to note like, a lot of people have just wanted to not talk about COVID and the coronavirus, the pandemic after 
after um, in this post-COVID period. Um, and China really flipped from uh, the most draconian of controls of COVID inside of its borders as of November to flipping um, to very open and kind of like trying to move totally beyond um, the, the, the coronavirus. Um, at, it, part of this story is, is a fascinating one, and I think getting into the details of why China moved and made that switch is a really fascinating one. But one of the pieces um, is that there was a frustration inside of the country, the rest of the world was moving away um, from kind of like masking and kind of COVID controls, lockdowns. Um, there was a fire in the in uh, Xinjiang, in, in Urumqi, where people who were locked down were trapped and died in their homes. Um, and that was seen as particularly uh, dangerous and, and, and frustrating and something that a lot of people could imagine themselves experiencing. Following that fire in particular, there was a protest movement around the country, uh, as well as on campus. I think there was at least some people that kind of stood outside of uh, the bookstore and, and held up blank sheets of paper. Um, and this was kind of the idea here is that you don't even need to tell to say what is the what we're protesting. Everyone knows uh, we don't need to have a write the message on our on our placard, um, which I think is kind of fascinating. And I think actually does kind of some people went much further in their critique than others. But I think in general, this could be seen as an anti zero COVID policies. And so in kind of following almost immediately after the wake of these protests, China kind of switches out uh, away from its zero COVID policies kind of just ripping the Band-Aid off completely and just kind of saying COVID's not such a big deal and things are going to be fine. Um, the estimates are that um, China has probably experienced over 1 billion infections over the past eight to 10 weeks. Um, but we have very little data on the number of deaths that that should, that that has produced. And so I don't know if those of you who have um, friends or family in China may or may not have experienced this, but this extent to which kind of everyone, it seems like got COVID very quickly. Um, but as with most people, um, most people don't die from COVID. And so the kind of most people's experience is that they or their families got sick and then kind of like recovered. Um, but with over 1 billion infections and the in kind of in, uh, infection fatality rate, we should expect something like hundreds of thousands, if not a million or more deaths over this over the short period of time. Um, but China has be, remained very hidden about this death rate. Um, and so the, the New York Times yesterday put out this really nice kind of like kind of like idea about trying to how to think about this. And they looked at obituaries of prominent scientists. And so given, um, given that we're at a scientific institution, I thought that this was particularly poignant for us. So the basically that kind of there is a kind of major academic institutions kind of put out obituaries when their, their faculty or prestigious members of their institutions die, as Cornell does, as do lots of places. And these kind of usually kind of bounce around it at one or two or three or four a month. Um, but then in December and January of the past two months, you saw a real explosion in these numbers in ways that suggest um, that the official death count, which is still only around 110,000, is really a vast undercount of what we, what we should expect. And so I do want to note that when we talk about kind of the, ec the economy and what's going to happen in 2023 in GDP numbers and these types of things for the rest of the lecture, I do want to note that this massive wave of death that is kind of being hidden by the Chinese government happened, is happening, and that we should not ignore it. Um, and I do think one of the reasons why the Chinese government kind of moved in the way that it did, removing the COVID barriers, is not just protests, but economic crisis. Um, and so this idea of Kind of like China's economic growth and its vitality is is an important one. Um, it's a it's a global it's again globally significant. That's why China has become the major emitter that it has. Um, and last year in 2022, China missed its growth target. China is an authoritarian state that likes to hit targets. It likes to set targets and it likes to hit targets. Um, but last year it failed to do so. It barely grew faster than the United States. And in fact, the official number that did come out kind of just pipped the United States just a little bit higher. Um, and that probably was manipulated in order to make sure that it did get on the other side of the US. Um, if you wanna talk about GDP manipulation, this is something that I, that I talk about in my last book, so I'm happy to do. But I think the, the basic idea is that China is a society that has gotten very used to rapid economic growth and kind of moving away from that seems politically dangerous. And so one of the reasons why kind of getting rid of zero COVID and lockdowns has been to try to, um, to kind of restart a, a, a sluggish economy. Um, and this sluggishness has been particularly rough in the housing market. Um, 
And before kind of a move, dive too deep into the housing market in China, I want to kind of step back and you may think about China as kind of moving forward economically in its economic development in two different ways. There are lots of different Chinas. There are, China is a, a big place with lots of diversity economically, um, politically, or not so politically, but economically, socially. Um, and in economic terms, it kind of has two main economic models. The first is exports. This is the kind of the China that is the clothes and the laptops and the toys and kind of lots of other things made for export. Um, and that this kind of export led development is a major piece and has been a major piece of China's economic development that out, people outside of the country are very aware of. Um, the second piece is maybe a little bit less well known, but the extent to which China has developed um, through kind of vast amounts of investment in infrastructure in um, kind of in assets like real estate, like um, roads or highways or airports, a high speed net rail network. Um, and apartments, lots and lots of apartments. Um, this graph is probably difficult to read, um, but this kind of is trying to track these different models over time. And so the, the, the bottom line here is this export line. And so it kind of like is increasing from the 1980s through the 2000s relatively quickly. And then in 2000, after WTO entry, the World Trade Organization, China shoots up um, and really expands its kind of global presence as an exporter. That's kind of the peak of the export narrative. Um, but then we have the global financial crisis and all of a sudden people in the United States and Europe stop having money to buy Chinese made goods and you see exports become less significant. And what replaces exports is investments, kind of a, a doubling down on kind of just building more inside of the country. And this kind of like, this building is what I want to focus on today. Um, so in 2020, the Wall Street Journal kind of uh, wrote a, a, a very nice piece called the $52 trillion bubble. Um, again, using big numbers to try to, to kind of like grab attention, China grapples with the epic property boom. So the idea is that China has kind of like, there is this vast amount of investment in real estate in China, and that this is a very attractive um, investment for people and they feel like it can never go down. And this, so this bubble, this, this term bubble is the concern is that if beliefs in this, this kind of like ever rising price of housing um, declines, that that might be dangerous. Um, and so China understands, the Chinese government kind of understands that this is a dangerous situation, that you can't just build and build and build and build um, and hope people buy and just assume that things are going to work out forever. Um, and so in, in 2020, kind of following this piece, not in response to it directly, but understanding the, the dangers, um, China implemented um, limited abilities for developers to build. So kind of developers, those who construct housing, um, had to kind of like pass various kind of red lines in order to continue to get access to debt to build things. Um, and that they would be cut off from accessing more loans in order to reduce the leverage of developers who would become addicted to debt-fueled growth kind of this idea of building and building and building forever. Um, so Evergrande, which is a, a mega developer, became the poster child of unsustainability, defaulting with over $300 billion in debt. Other developers such as um, kind of Modern Land and others also failed to repay creditors in 2020 and 2021. And so the, the fascinating piece about this kind of like real estate bubble story is that it is at the same time apartments that are empty. It's not just like apartments that are full of people and kind of there is real demand for these, this is housing. But in, in fact, a lot of the apartments are kind of apartments in the middle of nowhere or outside of minor cities that people are buying as investments. And so, and again, this also is relatively well known. This idea of ghost towns or ghost cities, you might've seen kind of this idea of kind of like whole cities being built where no one actually is there. Um, which is a little over dramatic, but this idea of kind of ghostliness of, of empty apartment complexes is a major piece of, of China's investment story. Um, this, this image is, is my favorite, uh, it's from 2016, it's Lanzhou. And I like this in particular because it, you kind of see the new construction on one side, you see the kind of dilapidated blue houses where the actual construction workers are living. And these, these are all empty over here. Um, and then they, they're riding on these unicycles. And I don't know if anyone actually rides on these, but in my mind, it's like, it's a future that will never come. No one will ever live in these apartments and no one will ever ride unicycles to get around town. And so I think this, this idea of kind of, if you build it, they will come, or if you build it, there will be demand is, has been part of this kind of like real estate bubble in China for a, for a number of years. 
But in 2022, some kind of like pieces of this real estate bubble began to pop. Um, and maybe one way to think um, kind of the question to ask is why do people build these houses if there's no one to actually live in them and why do people buy them? So the answer to these questions is I think kind of like me kind of go piece by piece here. So why build if there are 30 million empty apartments in China? Um, they may not be people who want to live in those houses, but there are people who want to buy them. Despite persistent poverty, economic growth has created a class of hundreds of millions of Chinese people with plenty of savings and not a lot of places to invest in. Capital controls limit their ability to diversify their holdings outside. So it's very hard for Chinese to send money abroad um, to invest in the United States stock market or, or what have you. Um, the Chinese stock market is a very risky uh, proposition, makes gambling in Macau uh, relatively safe. Um, and so, and the Chinese government itself has repeatedly signaled that home prices will never collapse. And so you get this dynamic where it's like, well, it's this safe investment and it's going to make money. So I'm going to continue to buy, even if I'm not going to live there themselves. So why do, why do people build? Because there are people that want to buy. Why do people buy? Because they don't have a good place to, to park their assets. And they believe that this will continue to be, to make sense. But over time, there's kind of like the, the economics of this is, is falling apart as debt numbers um, kind of increase. And um, you also see this is happening at the, the local government in China. So local governments in China, kind of one of the major ways that they raise revenue is by selling land. Con they control the access to land inside of, of, of urban areas and they kind of sell off land or lease land to developers. Um, last year in 2022, in part because of the the financial crisis or the, the COVID crisis, you saw a real decline in kind of that revenue from, from the property sector, about 20 to 30%. Um, and given that this is a major source of their revenue, you actually saw overall national level kind of deficits going and hitting record numbers, over a trillion dollars um, for a given year. So this is kind of like this very kind of like precarious situation the Chinese government knows and is trying to kind of deflate this bubble People kind of understand that it is a dangerous situation, but are hard, it's hard to move out of it. And so navigating this is this very difficult question. Um, okay, so that's great. That's very interesting, Jeremy. What about, why is this the carbon triangle? And the connection back to climate change is that China produces half of global steel and cement. Those sectors globally are about 14% of global emissions. Each is about six or seven, 8%. Um, Steel is extremely heavy in the kind of like energy and intensive in its creation. Um, cement also has this kind of like property, but where if, you, if you, you're cooking the limestone, you have process emissions. It's literally just the actual process of making cement produces, releases CO2. And so you get around 14% of global emissions. China produces half of that. That is 7% of all of global emissions are Chinese steel and cement. And if what a lot of that steel and cement is doing is going to build apartments that are not actually being used by people as housing, then this is a major kind of like, this is a major piece of the global emissions story. Um, I would argue that alongside kind of like methane leaks from oil and gas and coal, um, as well as kind of deforestation, China's industrial kind of or, or construction sector is probably number three in terms of kind of like big global wasted um, emissions, emissions that don't real, really serve human needs and human services. Um, and so if that much of the cement and steel is being used for housing uh, for no one and that stops, it could be a huge win for global emissions. So that's kind of where we are. Um, that's where we were when I began this essay a few, a few months ago, I kind of thought, in 2020, we see this real decline. So this on the, the red line here is new construction. This is in kind of like millions of square meters. So kind of huge amounts of construction that is taking place in China. And you see it kind of like moving along. Um, and in 2022, 2021, 2022, you see this beginning of a steep decline um, to around a level of about a million or a thousand million square meters or a billion square meters of housing. Um, uh, in the past, in a, in a single year. The kind of estimate for that people who look at this kind of like think about the amount that is a steady state, because in the end, like you have a billion people, that uh, 1.4 billion people that live in China, people need housing, housing deteriorates over time, you need to have new construction. 
So the steady state is not zero. It's not that red line is never going to go down to zero, but it's probably closer to 500 million. So to go down another 50% or maybe 700 million. So it still needs to go down another 30 to 50%. Um, and so that is a, a big um, question is, is that going to happen or not? Um, on the, the other axis on the right axis, the right Y axis is kind of changes in emissions over quarter by quarter. And here you actually see that um, kind of in the, the past year, China really has had a deep decline or has had a relatively significant decline in emissions um, until, um, until the end of, of last year. And so the question is, where is that going to go um, forward? Is China going to kind of like, is this construction kind of line going to continue to be allowed to kind of mosey down or is it going to be, is it going to change? And so the, this is a real question that is like, in the news today, and I think a policy question that is facing the Chinese government is facing investors around the world. Um, and there are real debates and people making serious bets on either side of this. So on the top, you have the FT, you have kind of a Citibank um, kind of researcher arguing that kind of China's recovery might be a bit less than meets the eye. That is, he doesn't think that there's going to be a return to construction. He doesn't think that the all of the kind of like pent up demand from COVID years are, are going to kind of lead to rapid growth, especially in the real estate sector. On the other hand, the steel mills are hoping that there is kind of a lot of, a lot of bets placed on kind of this reinvigoration of the market. Um, so I think that this, like this is, I think, one of the biggest questions that is happening out there um, in the world today, and particularly in, in when we think about emissions. The Chinese government is interested in rapid growth. It thinks that this rapid growth is part of its story of economic success, and people are used to it. And if it, it allows it to collapse, that that might be very dangerous. This is where people's wealth is stored after all. And so if you allow that kind of like that housing wealth to, to reduce in value, people might be upset. And so this kind of navigating this, they understand there's too much housing, there's too much construction, they need to tone it down, there's too much debt, but there's also how do you navigate this kind of like deflating of a property bubble when everyone has lots of these assets? Is a, is a fascinating and I think the most politically consequential kind of like global uh, climate change story that we have today. So I know I raced through a lot of material that I've been thinking a lot about and I'm sure it's kind of um, maybe overwhelming. So I'm happy to kind of from here, just say thank you and begin a conversation. So thanks. So, however, yes. Do you think of eco-authoritarianism and martial law as uh, uh, analogous or such? So I think eco-authoritarianism could have lots of different kind of like modes. Um, it doesn't have to be that kind of like Xi Jinping stands up and de declares that there will be no more meat eaten in the country. We will eat like there will be no more meat consumed. It could be kind of, it could be just simply commanding that there will be um, subsidies, that there will be land, this land will be used for urban construction. It, there's, so there's different ideas about what eco-authoritarianism could be. It could be that it's, it's simply kind of moving things faster, but still allowing some kind of like feedback, or it could be kind of martial law. It could, you could go along a whole spectrum, I think. So I don't think, and so to, to be clear, I'm not uh, like accusing the, the kind of writer of that piece saying that he wants martial law and wants to be able to tell everyone that you can no longer eat meat, everyone has to be vegan, that this, like, this is a, there are, there are gradations here. I think there is a question, I think, about the extent to which what we call democratic processes end up being captured by kind of, by people with particular, in, particular specific interests. So for instance, in the housing debate in the United States, kind of like, who actually decides about how much housing should be built in cities? Is it kind of the community at large? Is it democratic? Is it the potential community that would like to live in that city who don't actually get to vote in its own kind of local processes? Or is it the people that have the time to show up at the local meetings? Is that democratic because it's participatory? Or is that not democratic because that those, that's kind of a, a particular subset of people? So I think there's, there's real debates about the level of democracy and what democracy means in this context and the ways that we need to think about or rethink our democratic processes in the United States or elsewhere that I don't think kind of rethinking kind of um, 
public petitioning for or kind of like local approval of housing is martial law, right? I think there's there's differences here, but there are some people that might think that this is local participation. I need to be able to just if if a neighbor can't decide kind of what's happening in their neighborhood, how are we a democracy? And I think there's just real debates about the extent to which we value that versus we need to value kind of like fighting uh, decarbonizing. And I think that that's, I think these are real political debates. And so I'm not, again, I'm not saying that the only thing that we need to do or that he thinks we need to do martial law, but that there is this kind of real kind of set of debates that are out there. And in particular, my critique is that a lot of people having this debate are inside of democracies embedded inside of them and frustrated with them and kind of look to authoritarianism, look to China in particular, and just say, kind of, it just it gets it. It's, it can do whatever it wants. It can go fast. And that's what we need in order to solve the climate crisis. I don't think, and I think that there's a lack of recognition about the politics inside of authoritarian states. And so that's one of the things that I'm trying to, to bring up. But thank you. Thank you. Yes. Do you think that China is going to actually meet its 2060 goal net zero? And if not, why would do you think that they would say that? Um, so 2060 is a long time from now. Um, and so in some ways, it's very easy to kind of make a promise about 2060 because like, I mean, it's possible Xi Jinping will still be alive in 2060, but like doing the numbers, that would be quite surprising. Um, and so I think the, the question of kind of where are China's emissions going? So China has not it's a kind of a dual goal kind of that has been announced. So 2030 is peaking emissions, 2060 is net zero. So China has not even at least officially stated that it has begun to turn kind of like to reduce emissions. The United States has already reduced emissions 25%, I think from its peak in 2005 uh, or so. Um, the China is still at, is, is plateauing and maybe going to go back up again, depending on what happens in the next year or so. Um, it's unclear where it's going to peak and so how hard it will get to, how hard it will be to, to get down to 2060. If it, um, why would it make the promise? I think, again, it's relatively easy to make promises about 2060. India promised, following China's promise, that it will get there at 2070, which is even further away. Um, and so, at, but a lot of other places said 2050, which feels, I think, in 2023, increasingly close. Um, I think that there's, so if China is to get to 2060, what would happen? There's a lot of kind of like, there's a, there would be a huge transition away from coal towards other kind of like resources and the extent to which China can build out its renewable resources. Something I didn't actually say in my, that are in my notes is that you may have noticed the sun doesn't always shine, right? Like that solar and wind are kind of intermittent that are extremely powerful and especially with batteries can solve a lot of the problem, but cannot provide like the full clean electrification that we, that societies want particularly uh, with as reliably as they would uh, demand. And so figuring out that last 10% or 20%, I think is a, is a technical problem, but is also a financial problem. So. And the extent to which they are able to do that, I think, is uh, an important one. The last thing I'll say is that um, it's relatively easy to build kind of solar farms out in the middle of the desert in China, just like it is in the United States. In China, it's a little bit easier than it is in the United States to build the transmission to connect those solar farms out to the kind of urban grids. But you can't just rely on kind of like huge solar farms out in the middle of nowhere because if those like if the sun isn't shining in that area, then you need to have other resources that balance. And so it's a lot easier and you lose on the transmission, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of NIMBY politics in China about like not wanting to build things in my neighborhood or kind of like, what are we going to use the land for? Is it going to be solar farms? Is it going to be something else or wind turbines? Or are those going to be out in the middle of nowhere? So China has similar debates as we have in the United States. And so I think there is a, like the general solution that people I think tend to agree on is that electrification is a key technique. We have a lot of clean resources and can move clean electrification forward. We can get a lot of the way there, maybe 80 to 90% of their way there, but then that last 10% is gonna be very difficult in terms of technically, and maybe we need things that we don't necessarily have. So I think China is likely to get kind of a lot of the way there um, by 2060. Um, will it get all the way or not? I, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a great question that I, I hope the answer is yes. I have, I have normative preferences here, but I don't, um, I don't have a great prediction.
Other questions? Yes. Um, I was just wondering, um, what do you like? What do you think China should do? Because obviously they need to um, have somewhere to put like people's assets and whatnot. But this way is damaging. So, like in your opinion, what's the best way to go about it? So one of the nice things about studying China is that people. Chinese government officials never ask me that question, right? So if I studied the United States, sometimes like people might ask like, well, what should we do? The Chinese government never asks, asks me what, what they should do. Um, and so, and, I, and I'm, that kind of lowers the pressure. That being said, like, so I, I think that they should try to navigate, I think they should think about the real environmental costs of this kind of like this, this bubble that they're continuing to perpetuate or trying to reinflate and that they should try to not do that. Um, what that means in terms of should they allow capital control, like capital controls to relax? Well, I think they they fear reasonably as a political scientist. I don't know if normatively how I'd feel about it, but I feel like they are concerned that if they relax these capital controls, a lot of people would send money out of the country. In fact, one of the stories that you saw at the end of the COVID, um, the zero COVID moment was there were all these stories about people wanting to get money out of the country. So the Financial Times had three or four different stories about Singapore kind of like loading up, uh, like lots of Chinese money flowing into Singapore in particular, but there is a lot of a desire to get money out of the country. Um, and I think that if they relax those controls that they fear that lots of money would, would flood out of the country and that might lead to this real sense of crisis that things are, that everyone else is getting their money out, I have to get my money out and that can lead to, um, to a kind of a, a a recession or a, a fear of this type of thing that can become self-fulfilling. So navigating this from their from the regime's or government's perspective is I think a very difficult line. Um, but I think clearly the solution to like continue to build more apartments where no one actually wants to live in them doesn't make sense. Um, but there are, right, there are lots of people that sell those apartments. There are lots of people that build those apartments that mine the coal, that kind of make the steel, um, that build this like kind of like process the cement. And so it is hard to move. It changes hard. Um, even when you're an authoritarian state that can kind of make decisions and enforce them, it is still hard to, to get things done. Um, yes, in the back. Yeah. Um, I know you said that when I'm based on that. Is there a way to shift the attention on real estate into building um, renewable energy? kind of investing in renewable energy. And like you just said, it creates all those jobs building real estate and kind of shifting those jobs into installing solar panels or energy. Is there like anything with that? Yeah, I mean, China is definitely, again, China is the, the world leader in construction of these facilities and in installation of these facilities. And so a lot of people are involved in those sectors. And one of the, to, to take a step back to the United States, one of the stories for the United States in this bill that we just passed, the Inflation Reduction Act, is that it is if you grow the clean energy sectors, they will become more politically powerful and thus will push for more, right? So if you, if you can kind of get a foothold, they will get stronger and stronger. And as such, they will kind of lead to better and better policy in their, in their direction. And so the idea in China is that China has those sectors and they're already becoming more and more powerful. That being said, the coal sector is still dominates its, its electricity and power system. Um, oil is still kind of the fuel that runs the vast majority of Chinese cars and Chinese um, citizens get upset when gasoline prices go up just like American citizens do, although fewer kind of rely on, on long commutes as, as Americans do. Um, so can I kind of, there's no easy switch from kind of like construction workers, um, to kind of like easily switch into the real, like kind of from real estate into these other kind of renewable energy sectors. There's like, there would be transition costs and transaction costs in doing so. Certainly there are people that are trying to do that and they are trying to think of better uses for, for labor or land. Um, but it would still inevitably, like people can't just switch jobs and kind of you're mining coal one day and then the next day you're installing a solar panel, like it requires different um, skill sets and, and so forth. So there would be major transitions and the question of who's going to pay for those? Um, how are individuals going to find these new jobs or new opportunities? Are they going, to, are you going to retrain the proverbial 55 or 60 year old worker who's just about to retire um, to go like become a solar installer? Um, to climb roofs and it's probably not going to happen, right? And so navigating those kind of particularities, I think is really 
is difficult in, again, in China or the United States. <clears throat> Yes. Um, you mentioned that China can be seen as either an eco villain or an eco savior. So, is there data comparing the negative and positive contributions of different countries towards climate change? And where does China stand in terms of net contribution? So, I think it's hard to say like net net benefit, right? So, it's like how many um, how many emissions are? So, how would you think about the benefit side? So, it's a reasonable question, right? So, these two narratives can we can we quantify them? and kind of like put them together and figure out what the net story is. Um, first of all, I do think that it's important to step back and in the political world, people don't, people tend to grasp narratives at intuitive levels rather than kind of rational quantified levels. And so people have this narrative or that narrative and tend to focus on one or the other. Um, that being said, we try could try to think about these things. I think the hard, we think about emissions in these very kind of easy to quantify terms, not easy, people do a lot of work to, to count things, but it's kind of, it's amount of kind of material and, and emissions into the atmosphere. Benefits, like emissions averted, it's hard to think about what like the, the benefits are. So I, like, so one of the things I described is this idea that China's massive investment in solar and uh, solar in particular, but renewables in general has led to cost declines. Is that, is, it's just really hard to compare that with the amount of CO2 that's in the air. They're just kind of different, they're different pieces of this kind of complex puzzle. Um, I think like the emissions are the emissions. That's just kind of what's happening. The the other is this thing that is an opportunity that has shifted, again, it's it's made the world kind of conversion to decarbonization much easier. And so that I think is a, a major point in its favor, kind of if you're kind of, but but there's no like judge, like China gets into heaven or China goes to hell, right? It's just, it's a, it's, it's interesting and important to think about, but I don't think we can really say, cause it's, it's apples and oranges or it's solar panels and, Carbon emissions. In the very far back, yes. Um, so China seems to be like winning the race for uh, cobalt and lithium for like yeah. electric vehicles and clean energy storage. Do you think that this is going to become like an emerging large geopolitical contention as more countries move towards clean energy economies? Yeah. So did everyone hear that? So the the question is about is China going to its leadership, its current leadership in the clean energy space, in particular the kind of like. Minerals, critical mineral space, cobalt and, and lithium, I think were particularly mentioned. Um, China is the leader in those. And is that going to become a geopolitical kind of piece of contention? Yes, I think it already is. I think the US government's Inflation Reduction Act is explicitly trying to dislodge Chinese dominance of these sectors um, by subsidizing American production of these goods. Um, so there's that's kind of like home shoring, kind of bringing your onshoring. There's friend shoring, this idea of kind of like, well, it doesn't have to happen in America, but it has to happen in quote unquote friendly countries or free trade countries. And then there are debates about is you is is the European Union, we don't have free trade agreements with them, but they are free and we trade with them, so we can call them free trade. There's all these kind of like funny ways that we're trying to navigate these circumstances. But I think a lot of it is this desire to get away from a dependence on China. So right now, China is the, the, the it doesn't, doesn't directly mine a lot of the lithium um, or cobalt of the world. It is the major processor of those, right? So this, and this is where kind of the engineers probably know a lot more than me. And so I don't want to overstep, but my understanding is that like the, the stuff that you get out of the ground is not, you can't just like stick it in a battery, right? You have to process that into various uh, purities and what have you, different chemical forms. And that that, that, that purification and processing is often kind of a dirty kind of like facility and not something that people like to have nearby. And so China, as it has in so many sectors, has kind of has come to kind of invest in kind of, there are places in China that have thought that this is what we're going to, to be strong in and has come to dominate those sectors. Um, the extent to which that will be actually shifted in the United States or by the Inflation Reduction Act or other kind of policies, I think is a real question. I think you have, um, and, and I'll say this in two ways. One is kind of this American desire to kind of like to, to have it all at home. Um, 
for energy security reasons, for its own reliability reasons. But I think there is this resistance to actually putting in lithium mines because those lithium mines are not just kind of like hypothetical or kind of abstract, they are at physical locations. And those physical locations might be in communities that have suffered unjustly from prior kind of exploitation. So in particular, lithium mines in Nevada near native spaces, like homes of Native Americans who have suffered from previous kind of moments of exploitation. How should we value kind of like that concern about kind of their own sacred spaces and kind of the needs for kind of like this energy transition? Those are hard questions and particularly hard in under democracy where we kind of value um, and allow debates. The extent, to, so that's one, um, the extent to which the United States can actually build and develop its own industries. The second is the extent to which the, the, the actual sources of these materials want to kind of stop being just the raw material sources and become the processors themselves in order to move up the value chain. So, Places like India or Indonesia with its, its nickel deposits, I think increasingly would like to become kind of like capture more of the value of the nickel that it is mining out of its own territory to process it itself because it can capture more value of that. Um, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the cobalt is kind of like uh, the cobalt production of the world is, is dominated in kind of often kind of really horrific working conditions, I think is not as far along, but I think probably has similar at least ideas. I'm sure there are people inside of that country that would like to capture some of that value too. So that, I think there's these, these two tensions. The United States would like to kind of like control that supply a little bit more, um, but can it do so? And then the second is, I think the suppliers, the raw material suppliers would like to be a, a more integral part of that process. So all of that, as well as like this Chinese piece and what is China going to do in response or the deals it's made, I think are big fascinating questions that will that are that I read stories about every day and that if you are in this world, I think are important um, and are going to shape some of the, the these questions going forward. The yeah, I'll say that. Other questions? Yes. Um, China is often still considered like a third world country. Yeah. Fossil fuels are often seen as, as like an easy way to develop these countries. So do you ever, do you foresee a future where China or other third world countries are able to develop the country while moving away from the fossil fuels? Yeah. So I, I think there is this, this, this general assumption, and I think this is something that was true, particularly a dozen years ago, this idea that, well, and, and it is the case that there are a lot of places in the world that have true energy poverty, right? There are a lot of people in the world that have no access to reliable electricity, that do not have kind of clean cooking. And so like do things like kind of like use wood to burn, kind of like to burn to cook their food in ways that are, are terrible air pollution wise. Indoor air pollution is as dangerous as, as outdoor air pollution for a lot of these people. And so I don't want to, so, I want to acknowledge that there is real energy poverty. China is relatively electrified and relatively increasingly, it's harder and harder for China to make the case that it is a least developed country. It is its economic, its gross develop, uh, its GDP per capita is increasingly kind of middle income territory. So China, and I think increasingly, it used to make the case that these developed countries are the polluters historically, they're the rich countries, they've, they're the source of the problem and they need to be the ones who, who deal with the problem. This was the origins of this kind of like Annex One, Annex Two of the Kyoto kind of back in the day. That is that those the rich countries, the those are the ones who are responsible, and they have to make real reductions. The, the developing countries don't have to do so. China, until Xi Jinping's 2060 agreements, really kind of like did not express a lot of. You could argue a little bit earlier, but did not express a lot of real commitments to ever going down, to kind of saying that it is going to reduce emissions um, concretely. And so that's one of the reasons why it's very exciting that China, uh, that Xi Jinping made this announcement, this 2016 net neutrality, or net neutrality, sorry, uh, net zero announcement. Um, so this is, that's an important piece of the story. It used to be the case that development um, and kind of like, that is emissions and GDP kind of economic development were very linked. And over time, the, the time trends do kind of point upwards. But over the past decade, you've seen a real split. You've seen a lot of countries kind of not just see GDP growing faster than emissions, but you've seen actual emission declines while countries have continued to grow economically. 
I think the United Kingdom is the most dramatic example of this, but the United States and lots of other countries have experienced this as well. China's emissions, as I said, have been relatively flat over the past decade, um, but its growth, its economic growth has continued. So there has been a decoupling of this kind of emissions and, and economic activity. So the extent to which China can continue to develop while kind of moving away from emitting, I think is a possibility. I think we have a lot of the tools to, to do that. Whether we can get all the way to zero is a, is a harder question, but I think there's a lot of existing technology implemented in existing ways could do a lot of work. And, and obviously like not building houses, right? Like not building wasteful things um, in the outside of cities that no one wants to live in uh, could do a lot of work. So I think there's, there's a lot of space there. I think it's a lot harder when we talk about um, kind of true energy poverty, countries that really like the, the true, like kind of least developed countries of the world that don't have reliable energy systems at all or electricity systems. And the idea that they can, like, which is something that, the, the, that has become a political crisis in the, in the past year, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a lot of European sites, um, kind of the, the natural gas imports from Russia that they relied upon, kind of stopped being stopped flowing. And so European states have invested in new infrastructure, new fossil fuel infrastructure domestically in order to kind of make sure that their own their own lights stay on, homes are heated. At the same time, the European Union and others who have, have tried to tell developing countries that they should not develop their fossil fuel resources or invest in their own fossil fuel infrastructure. And that's been seen by the developing world as very hypocritical, understandably. And so I think that there are real tensions in the, how are we dealing with the problems of today versus what are, versus are we going to use these kind of assets in the future in ways that are reasonable or are, we, are they going to become stranded? So if you build a coal power plant outside of Ithaca today, which I would not recommend doing, um, and you had an economic reason and it worked for a couple of years, it is unlikely that it would work for its lifetime, right? Usually when we build these types of assets, they last for 30 to 50 years. And we kind of like build in our models, the idea that we're going to get returns for that entire time period. Well, a lot of fossil fuel infrastructure that's being constructed today is really incompatible with the idea of net zero in 2050 or 2030, 2040. Um, and so how are we going to balance these ideas? In particular, that's, in, that's a richer country problem than it is a poorer country problem. Um, China is simultaneously building huge amounts of solar as well as building new coal power plants. A lot of those coal power plants are kind of being run as backup plants to, to be there when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing, um, or, the, or there's a huge drought and the hydro plants aren't kind of operating to the same power capacity as they usually do. And so, the question of like, are these investments, investments that make sense that are going to be economically wasteful? Those are, I mean, people make all kinds of bets all the time, right? And, and people lose money and make money all the time. And we usually let chips fall where they may. The question is, what should governments do to subsidize or to encourage particular paths of development, I would say. But that's a long-winded answer to a, to a great question. Yes. Um, how is China cooperating with the world on climate change? So can, you, can you ask it again? Sorry. How has China cooperated with the rest of the world on climate change? Yeah, I think this cooperation question is really interesting. Um, as one of the one of the ideas that we have out there is that we need we need China to kind of cooperate or to work with us. And one of the ideas of the the Paris Agreement, I would argue, is the idea that every country is setting its own kind of regulations, it's, its contributions to this kind of global goal of reducing um, emissions. And I think increasingly it is the case that kind of this ratcheting up of we're gonna do this, no, and we're gonna do we one better and so forth has had some power um, rather than we're only going to do this if you do this too. It's, it's not necessarily a tit for tat. China is going to like burn coal just to spite the United States, right? It's not really the way that this works. And so I think that China has its ideas about what is most efficient and economically cheapest or beneficial, profitable for them. And the United States does and Chile does and everybody does. And the question is, can we kind of like have all of those kind of ratchet up in this cleaner direction so that 
individually countries kind of go back and forth and they're like, well, it's a little bit more expensive to, to shut down a coal plant and to kind of rely on batteries, but we're going to do that because it's a relatively cleaner process than the opposite prospect. Um, because we value this, because we value the global publicity or the, the, the kind of PR, what have you, um, legitimacy that comes with it. So I don't think it's necessarily, there are kind of like more direct issues of cooperation. So measurement is really important. How, like, how much methane is leaking from Chinese coal mines is a huge question that I think a lot of researchers are trying to get at, but is, that would be, that would benefit, um, they would be benefited by kind of cooperation with China and other investigatory teams in other places. Um, so sharing of technologies and, and so forth. Um, but I think for the most part, this has become a kind of a domestic story rather than as this global, um, this global narrative. It's again, in part because of the cheap cost of renewables, this is no longer a, we all have to suffer. And so I'm suffering this much, you have to suffer this much as well. It's become a, a narrative that is instead, I'm growing in this clean way, you can grow in this clean way too. Now, the extent to which we're actually gonna get all the way to zero um, with this kind of growth, I don't, I don't know necessarily if we'll get there, but that's the way that the international agreements are operating now. Yes. How do you see the role of like um, the kind of reputation of misinformation and like distrust of the Chinese government playing a role in the like international politics of this like um, green energy revolution? Yeah, that's a great question. So my last book was all about kind of GDP data manipulation, and so I'm I'm thinking about this, but I'm also trying to not think about this because when you write a book, it takes a lot of time and you spend all your energy thinking about it and you don't want to think about that anymore. At least that's my experience. And so one of the, like the, the way that if you, if I really wanted to just go the easiest way to think about from data manipulation to China and climate is to think about the emissions trading system, right? Like carb carbon emissions trading and carbon credits and that kind of system and who counts and who gets what and like what's fake and what's real. And I've tried to avoid that a little bit out of like, I don't want to say like PTSD from writing a book about data manipulation, but it's it's not, I just haven't dove into those numbers. Um, but that is that is a major piece of this. But that's again more of a domestic story about who is benefiting and who is like who's who's getting the benefits from the system, who's cheating, who's lying, those types of things. There are interesting narratives in China about emissions equipment and kind of like, are you running your scrubbers or are you just, did you install them, but you don't actually run them because running them costs energy and you don't want to do that. So, or you only come, you only run them when the officials come to look, those types of kind of like tit for tat uh, stories. Um, but the, the extent to which, I mean, in the end, it's pretty clear, like when coal plants are running, it's pretty obvious from the outside world, we can look and see what's happening um, and we can see the power grid, we can see how much steel, we can't see directly, but we can kind of estimate how much steel was produced, how much cement was produced. And so we have a pretty good sense about China's global, like China's emissions. So the actual cheating is not, it's hard to, to cheat at that level. I mean, I'm sure that like, you can shave some things off and you can under report, but the extent to which this is relatively observable, I think makes it not as, not a, a little bit different than like GDP, which is this kind of like amorphous, like no one can see GDP. It's just like this idea, this number that we talk about um, that's really important and shapes our expectations. So I don't think, so the extent to which we kind of have this general distrust of China or Chinese numbers and is, is an important piece of the general political story, but I don't think there's that much reason to distrust China's emissions numbers in particular, because like in the end, we can see a lot of this from, from space. Um, yes. Just follow up the question. Yeah. Uh, what's happening or what's happened was a couple of years ago, some local governments in China, they actually uh, shut down the heating, shut down the uh, factories to yeah. meet those uh, local targets, right? So it's about uh, decreasing the, the emission. And I have a question is, you mentioned a little bit about A4 was the, one of the last goal on the, um, uh, on the CCP to end the uh, zero COVID. Mm -hmm. So do you think there is a role or roles that the ordinary Chinese people and the civil society 
and play in terms of uh, achieving China's net zero goals? Yeah, so this is a great question. So it's a nice it's a nice bookend to the first question, which is about kind of authoritarianism and this top down narrative. And I do think there's a a real sense in which China is like China is a, a society and authoritarian governments need to think about their own populations and kind of interact and govern those populations and can't just do whatever they want. They listen and they they do pay attention. Um, there was a very nice book that was written a couple of years ago called um, China Goes Green um, that tries to think about this um, kind of in general and really makes the case strongly that where China has succeeded in environmental terms, less on the carbon side and more on air pollution and others has been from bottom up pressure from citizens complaining about air pollution, about kind of local trash problems or kind of like things that didn't work with various um, big government initiatives. And that they make the case that what is needed um, for China to move forward, to, to go green, is this kind of like citizen level participation. And I, I don't disagree in general. I think I'm pro citizen participation. Um, and, but I do think that to, to kind of like nuance that story a little bit. I do think that climate and carbon emissions is a little bit different. It's a little bit more amenable to top-down action in the sense of if a government dictates that there will no more ICE vehicles, if there's no more internal combustion vehicles that will be sold or be allowed to operate, then the industrial like kind of system will, will shift um, in ways that are kind of like pretty dramatic. If they, if they shut down coal plants. Like there's just a lot of emissions really are at this very high end, as opposed to kind of like air pollution, which is a more kind of like from lots of different sources. The If you cut down the, the core major sources in climate, I think you can make a lot of the, the progress. And so I do think that climate change is a little bit more amenable to kind of top-down control than is kind of general environmental issues in, in China. And so I would disagree with that Kind of, I would, I would kind of like nuance the, the the argument of that book a little bit, but I do think that a lot of the top, the bottom up pressure has been really significant. And to kind of to to really um, hit this, I think that the kind of like the the air pollution problem that faced a lot of Chinese cities, and often when I have these slides, I kind of like have a picture of Beijing where you can barely see the buildings across the street because there's so much air pollution. That air pollution is not directly the same stuff that is that like the PM 2.5 is not the same stuff as because is global warming right as, as greenhouse gases it's not warming the atmosphere directly necessarily it, it's not the major one but this like but most of the ways that you improve that local air pollution um, by improving energy or kind of like car efficiency or cleaning up cars by shutting down coal factories also has this carbon benefit. And so I think that popular kind of action to reduce air pollution has already succeeded in ways to kind of push kind of carbon emissions. I think it is harder and I'm, I'm excited to see, but I've not seen a lot of evidence so far of popular pressure to directly kind of go after carbon because in the end we don't like carbon dioxide, we breathe, right? We don't, we don't see it. It doesn't kind of cause direct harms in the same obvious way. There are interesting moments, like kind of like weather events or others, where we might see, and I, but I've yet to see a real linking of the narrative between this is because of climate change, this like this flooding of Wuhan, and we need to change, like we need to move our energy system. I haven't seen that at the popular level, but I really am looking forward to that. So thanks everyone.